name is Zachary Thompson. and I'm an English education student at Missouri State University. Um, I wrote this paper for my Survey of American Literature 2 class uh, this spring. It is titled, If Not Calmly Yet Strongly, The Inversion of Victorian Era Domestic Structure in William Dean Howell's Editha. In his 1905 short story, Editha, American author William Dean Howells follows the up downs and eventual end of the relationship between a young woman, the titular Editha, and her fiancé, George. In it, Editha urges her fiancé to join the army and fight in the impending Spanish-American War of 1898, going so far as to break off their engagement and send him with her ring. Unfortunately, George dies during the war, and Editha is forced to reckon with the decision she has made for her husband. The story is part cautionary tale, warning of the danger of war and mocking its supporters, and part critique on the domestic structure of American culture in the late 19th and early 20th century. Throughout the course of the story, Howells inverts the literary conventions surrounding female characters in this period of American literature, such as the domestic angel and hysterical women tropes, and showcases a flipped version of the domestic structure with a different type of female character at its center. The aforementioned tropes defined women in the early American literary realism, especially in works such as Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, which features the female protagonist's hysteria as its central theme. Coventry Patmore's The Angel in the House exemplifies the peak of the domestic angel trope, depicting Patmore's wife as, quote, the epitome of female perfection, end quote, as critic Christine Cross Dick points out. Both of these narratives are present in Howell's story, but they are inverted, as is the classic domestic structure of a dutiful housewife and domineering husband who calls the shots. Through historical context of these tropes and close reading exploration of Editha and George's interactions, Howell's attempt to build a new narrative can be revealed, starting with the domestic angel trope. The domestic angel is a trope that depicts Victorian age women, especially those who are wives, mothers, etc., as silent, subservient women who live to make the lives of their husband or the other men in their life as easy as possible. In her early 2012 article, Reframing the Domestic Angel, Christine Krauss Dick defines the domestic angel trope and explores its historical context and how it is implemented in literature. She begins by defining the trope as such, quote, the ideal Victorian wife endowed with her beauty, her docile manner, and her commitment to create a comfortable and orderly home for her husband, end quote. This literary convention has its origins in the aforementioned Angel in the House, an English narrative poem where Coventry Patmore commends his deceased wife as a perfect partner, docile and subservient, while, quote, maintaining the home as a haven, end quote. This narrative of the dutiful housewife who strives for domestic bliss was established further in popular literature of the 19th century and advice columns frequented by women, which helped women adjust to the insurmountable pressure of, quote, anchoring the family to the home. End quote. In extended analysis of Victorian-era periodicals, Krausdick took note of three common anticipations of the domestic angel, quote, practical domestic administration, tending carefully to the creation of an atmosphere of comfort, and managing household funds with shrewd economy, end quote. From this, one can glean that the domestic angel was expected to fit into a neat box, and this expectation was found in many pieces of literature accessible to women in the domestic sphere. In Editha, Howells inverts the domestic angel trope by depicting Editha as a strong, independently thinking woman who controls her relationship with her fiancé. Critic and professor of English Susan K. Harris supports this in a 1993 article in which she references Editha's revolutionary characterization, claiming that she is, quote, not what her culture would designate as an exemplary female character, end quote. She goes on to further explore the context of the actions that make Editha a transgressive character type in the late 19th century, including her autonomy over her free will, control over her own energy, and the ability to express herself and her ideas. Harris argues that Editha is not seen as exemplary, quote, because she has the energy and self-confidence that belong to the male per preserve, and because she uses language aggressively, end quote. This energy and self-confidence, as Harris puts it, is incompatible with the narrative surrounding the domestic angel that permeated literature during the time in which Editha was set and written. Early in the story, Howell's narrator tells of Editha's dilemma with speaking her mind regarding her opinions of her fiancé's hypothetical enlistment, saying, quote, It was no time to pick and choose her words. She must sacrifice anything to the high ideal she had for him, and after a good deal of rapid argument, ended with the climax, end quote. 
In this passage, Howell shows Editha as not conforming to the ideals of her culture. She must not edit herself, but rather speak from the heart. Howells even goes so far as to paint Editha as controlling over her fiancé and the status of their engagement to each other. In a scene that depicts Editha writing a letter to her fiancé announcing and endorsing the end of their relationship until he fulfills his duty, this is especially prevalent. Editha writes, quote, The man I marry must love his country, first of all, end quote, and sends personal affects reminiscent of their engagement with it, including the engagement ring. She is willing to take the status of their relationship into her own hands and end it if it means her fiancé will be fulfilling her personal requirements of a noble man. By looking at the ways Editha all but explicitly and verbally rejects the domestic angel trope, we can begin to see the ways that Howells is attempting to flip the domestic structure that was endorsed by his contemporaries. Moving on from the domestic angel, we come to the hysterical woman trope. A hysterical woman is a woman that, according to Sigmund Freud, as echoed by Elaine Showalter, is unable to tell a complete, smooth, and exact story. They left out, distorted, and rearranged information because of sexual expression. Historian Carol Smith Rosenberg corroborates this claim, saying that women were often seen as being, quote, highly impressionistic, suggestible, and narcissistic. Their moods changed suddenly, dramatically, and for seemingly inconsequential reasons, end quote while being examined by medical professionals. In my full paper, I explain more on how Smith Rosenberg helps paint a picture on why a, modern, uh, why a woman might be diagnosed as hysterical and how she would have gotten to that point. This thought is additionally cultivated by a description of the differences and expectations regarding young women and their eventual role as a mother and leader of the household. The separation between these set of rules is vast. The ideal woman, as Smith Rosenberg claims, is, quote, emotional, dependent, and gentle, end quote. These principles are flipped on their heads when the same woman becomes a dutiful housewife, where she is needed to hold a position of strength, be self-reliant, and be able to provide enough support, both emotionally and physically, for her children and the running of the household. As Smith Rosenberg puts it, she was expected, oh, quote, she was expected to face severe bodily pain, disease, and death and still serve as the emotional support and strength of her family. What's more, women of this time reported high levels of, quote, isolation, loneliness, and depression, end quote, and medical professionals began to designate hysteria and other nervous diseases as the causes of these reports. It is pretty clear to see, however, that the immense pressure put on young women and the dichotomy of roles women took on at young ages more than likely led to this widespread hysteria. At times, Editha is depicted as meeting the requirement of a typical hysterical woman, and at others, comes across perfectly level-headed, just outspoken. This leads to the true beauty of Howell's writing. He crafts a unique, three-dimensional female narrative that redefines the oft-utilized parameters for women in literature. One instance of this would be early in the story. Howells writes, quote, A generous sob rode in Editha's throat for the humility of a man so very nearly perfect, who was willing to put himself below her, end quote. This passage shows Editha acting within the frame of a hysterical woman with the generous sob in her throat, but her insistence on having her ideas reign supreme in the relationship shows a strength in herself, something that is unique to Editha as a character, especially in late 19th century literary discourse. Perhaps the best example of this complexity, however, comes when Editha is writing the already discussed breakup letter to George. The narrator sat, states, quote, she sat down, if not calmly yet strongly, and wrote, end quote. This, if not calmly yet strongly, is of particular interest to me in the context of Howell's innovation of the female narrative. The extensive background research I've done and that has already been presented surrounding the historical context of the histor hysterical woman narrative helps to point to hysterical women being just that, hysterical. They are the antithesis of calm, acting extremely dramatic with swift mood changes for, quote, seemingly inconsequential reasons, end quote, as Smith Rosenberg cites. So given this context, Edith is sitting to write not calmly, can point to Howell's crafting a familiar hysterical narrative for the titular protagonist, especially given Edith's history of lashing out and making what could be seen as rash decisions earlier in the text. However, the inclusion of the yet strongly tacked on at the end adds a layer to the proverbial onion that is Edith's characterization. 
She is not calm, not docile like the world would want her to be, in accordance with the domestic angel trope, but she is not weak either. Editha defies this trope, setting the stage for the rest of the story to attempt in flipping the domestic structure of the late 19th century on its head. Early on in Editha, the titular character attempts to separate male and female approaches to belief systems, saying, quote, men seemed to feel bound to do what they believed and not think a thing was finished when they said it, as girls did, end quote. This particular passage is confounding, considering the driving plot behind the story is Editha forcing her pro-war, pro-enlistment beliefs on her fiancé, George, going so far as to place the future of their engagement and impending marriage on them. Howells expertly utilizes irony here, showing how Editha directly contradicts herself by saying men are unable to look past their beliefs and will do anything to accomplish goals in line with their belief system. Susan Harris's take on moments like these in the story is that Editha directly balks at the typical expectations of a woman of her time. Later, Editha's place in conversations surrounding war is questioned. Typically, women in the late 19th century, quote, were not involved in making decisions about wars or fighting in them, end quote. Edith's substantially high expectations for her husband also helped to invert classic domestic structures of the 19th century. In the early passages of the story, Howell's narrator describes these expectations, saying that Edith, quote, always supposed the man who won her would have done something to win her, end quote. She also, as is explored heavenly, hev heavily in the story, expects her husband to fight in a war at her beck and call because it's her idea of an honorable act. These expectations echo many men's expectations for their wives, as seen in Angel in the House, discussed previously. Editha is choosing the path her future husband takes and has full autonomy over the kind of man she will marry, which was unusual for women of her day and age. The strongest piece of textual evidence from Howells comes when Editha expresses her satisfaction with the potential dismemberment of George while he is at war. As Howells' narrator puts it, quote, she thrilled with the sense of the arm around her. What if that should be lost, end quote. This moment aids in further painting Editha as striving to be the controlling one in the relationship with her fiance. By creating a sense of dependency, Editha is controlling her fiance even more. In a culture where a woman depends on her man to stand on and have any kind of financial footing, Editha is directly spitting in the face of this idea. By being her fiancé's support, if he were to lose an arm, Editha is once again being the man in the relationship. Philip Furia echoes this sentiment in his article, Editha, the Feminine View. In it, he expresses that Editha's use of this example gives her, quote, a clear superiority over her fiancé, end quote. This two-arm narrative that Howells includes in the story shows that Editha literally and figuratively wants an upper hand over her husband. She wants to build the dependency on herself that most women have on their husbands in the late 19th century. All of this, the close reading of Howell's text coupled with these secondary sources, helps connect the thread between Editha and George's relationship and the inverted expectations of Victorian domestic life. Studying the history of female narrative in literature, such as that in Editha, can not only grant us access into the psyche of women, or in Howell's case, a woman through the eyes of a man, but also to a wider scope of vision. Understanding the complex history that literature, particularly American, has with femininity and womanhood permits deeper reflection on how that complex history is mirrored in almost every facet of our culture. As exhibited, femininity was scrutinized as hysterical, not just by literary scholars and authors, but medical prof professionals and the general population as well. As Krausdick explains it, quote, for centuries, hysterica has been seen as characteristically female. The hysterical woman, the embodiment of a perverse or hyper femininity, end quote. So with this in mind, the study of the aforementioned complex history becomes increasingly more important. Without it, society risks the possibility of women once again being subjugated to their womanhood being the cause for disdain, intervention, and in extreme cases, incapacitation. The narrative in Editha, while unique and certainly fresh in its publication year, still depicts women in ways that a modern audience would recoil at. However, as previously mentioned, the study of Editha and works akin to it does not strive to sympathize with literature and excuse its inherent flaws, but rather to engage with it and discuss those flaws. 
ignoring literature that society may deem as problematic by our 21st century uh, sentiments does not cease it from existing, but rather allows it problematic fragments to permeate and pervade our collective cultural consciousness in a silent yet dangerous way. We must attack the study of literature and literary history head on and do so, if not calmly, yet strongly, as Howells would put it.